Welcome to Act and Unwind, an ongoing conversation on a free and virtuous society. I'm your host, Eric Cohn. I want to thank you for listening, and I want to ask that if you're listening to us on our website, that you navigate right now to the show notes for this episode, where you will find a link to subscribe directly to Acton Unwind at Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or anywhere else where you listen to find podcasts. And if you like this program, please leave us a five-star review at Apple Podcasts so as to help more people find our show. I'm joined today by Dan Huger, Acton's librarian and a research associate. And Dylan Palman, executive editor of the Journal of Markets and Morality and a research fellow here at Acton. This week, we'll discuss the horrible shooting in Michigan State University, the train derailment in East Palestine, Ohio, and the editing of Roald Dahl's works. But first, today is President's Day. Uh, I believe it is also Washington's birthday, which is something that is worth celebrating, but because we can't have nice things. At some point uh, in history, we changed it to a celebration of all presidents on President's Day. So we celebrate people like George Washington and John Adams and Thomas Jefferson and... uh, Nixon now more than ever. And Nixon now more than ever, along with Woodrow Wilson and James Buchanan. There's no other way William Henry Harrison would get a day. Well, he he didn't even really get a day as president. He got about Um, a month. He did. He was the best president ever. He did nothing and he died quickly. Are you like me (laughs) and the only thing that I can think of when I hear William Henry Harrison is the Hall of Lesser Known Presidents from The Simpsons? (laughs) I'm William Henry Harrison. I died in 30 days. Um, We're the Lesser Known Presidents of the USA. That's, That's what I go to first. But we do celebrate all presidents equally. So rather than recognizing some of the great leadership of this country's history, maybe we take a moment to point out how ridiculous it is that we group them all all together to celebrate them equally and point out if there's one who you think really should be excluded from this celebration. I will happily start and uh, once again uh, flog the dead horse. That is uh, a a thing for me uh, and for many other people, rightly so, about Woodrow Wilson, who is probably the worst president that we had, uh, who resegregated the civil service, who uh, showed birth of a nation at the White House, uh, who was really just kind of a nasty eugenicist and an an unlikable person. There was a story I remember hearing that the way that you could ingratiate yourself to Woodrow Wilson was to find someone that you both hated. That's how he would start liking you, is if you found someone that you both hated. Um, So clearly, yes, a man that we should be... uh, that we should be celebrating. Awesome. I always remember that too because I uh, remember first reading and finding out about what you know what you learned about Woodrow Wilson when you were in elementary school was basically you know leadership during World War One and the League of Nations that turned into the United Nations. And I remember when I started finding out that like oh my god this guy was terrible was when uh, I was in college. George W. Bush was president. It was post 9-11 period. And all I could remember thinking is all the stuff that they're saying that George W. Bush is allegedly doing or wants to do is all stuff that Woodrow Wilson actually did. Like create the first propaganda ministry in the country. He had these, well, I think they were called six minute men that went out to whip up um, uh, furor in favor of the, uh, the first world war. Um, you know, he jailed political dissidents. He shut down newspapers. Like all the stuff they said about George W. Bush that he was allegedly doing, Woodrow Wilson actually did. Uh, and ignoring the fact that one of the reasons that you can say that George W. Bush is a fascist is precisely because George W. Bush wasn't a fascist and we didn't live in a fascist dictatorship at the time. Yeah. Wilson, so that thus endeth my, uh, my sure. rant about Woodrow Wilson. Wilson also greatly expanded the administrative state and advocated the idea of a living constitution uh, in, order to, first... in order to do that, basically say maybe we don't need to care about what the constitution said and why it said it at the time. It can just be whatever we want it to be right now. And what I want it to be is well, and all a, these things that I want. That and which terrible. has turned into a, uh, a, na- a nascent movement on the political right who want to find their own way of having the Constitution say whatever they actually just want it to say. But I should note there as well, with no offense to uh, some of our friends with advanced degrees who are also very good and decent people, uh, the first PhD to be president of the United States. Oh, yeah, that was a mistake, definitely. (laughs) There's an interesting thing when when you're commemorating an office, especially when the founders conceived of this nation as as being composed of, of three sort of co-equal branches of government. 
um, to privilege the presidency seems very strange. Um, in terms of bad presidents, I mean, this is the, this is the other thing is presidents give us an occasion to reflect on things. And even presidents that did great things. I mean, we think about Ulysses S. Grant as an example, you know, um, he has a complicated legacy, um, was a big supporter of the Blaine Amendments, limiting religious freedom for Catholics. So you have, and, the, and Grant is not alone in here. Um, Lord Acton, you know, famously said that, you know, great men are almost always bad men. Um, and when you reduce it to a celebration of everyone, that causes us to not be able to reflect on the individual legacies of, of anyone. And this sort of disembodied, you know, we we are a nation of laws and not men, but men are the people that are integral to the implementation of those laws. This is part of the character of the executive as it does reside in a person. Um, and it's important when considering that office, we consider those persons that have held the office and consider them thoughtfully in both in both their 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 greatness, their mediocrity and, you know, in some cases, evil. One note in there as well, since you had brought up Nixon now more than ever uh, earlier in the conversation, the idea of the branches being co-equal was a Nixonian invention. Um, the, if you again go back and read the Constitution, now more than ever. they are not co-equal. Congress clearly has more power and more authority than either of the two other branches. They can, other than the Supreme Court, they could abolish every single court in the land. They can fire. Uh, members of the executive branch, including the president of the United States, the president, despite the wishes of people like Woodrow Wilson and FDR and those that surrounded them, uh, could not fire Congress, um, even if they really wanted to. Uh, so th th I think this is one of the things that has actually created a lot of the problems that we're seeing today is Congress no longer acts like it is the preeminent branch, uh, like it has it the no power longer and acts as if it it's a co-equal branch. It doesn't. You, you are correct. And it's been more than happy to farm out anything, any responsibility that it has been given to the executive. And I remember the story being perfectly illustrated by uh, Cory Gardner, the former senator from Colorado, when uh, Jeff Sessions had just become attorney general, issuing a memo stating that they were going to uh, not adhere to previous Department of Justice policy. That was hands off to states that had legalized marijuana. And Cory Gardner threw a gigantic fit about this and basically demanded from President Trump that he have his attorney general reinstate that memo, apparently failing to realize that he's a senator and he can introduce legislation anytime he wants to achieve the same end the way that it's supposed to be achieved, not through some memorandum from the attorney general. But that's hard. And as members of Congress will say now, even things that are like 70, 30, 80, 20 issues in terms of their popularity, if it's done by the executive branch, they get all the upside of that because the good thing happened and none of the downsides. So they don't even have to piss off the 20 percent. They can just say, well, the executive branch did it. It wasn't me. It is one of the main reasons why Congress and especially our, our federal government is as dysfunctional as it is now. Yeah. So piggybacking on uh, Dan's comment, um, his his reference to Acton, that great men are almost always bad men, uh, it does make me wonder if maybe what we should eliminate is all the good presidents uh, from President's Day and then only dwell on the bad ones or only the bad stuff of the good ones. Um, so we could keep going. You, you mentioned Grant. We could talk about uh, Lincoln and the Native Americans. We could talk about, you know, You could talk about Lincoln and a lot of things. And, we could yeah, and a lot of things. Bring, bring a, um, get a libertarian on this podcast yeah. and they'll have plenty to yeah, say about Yeah, I mean, Lincoln. then I might end up defending him. Um, but uh, but the, the point being, it's a mistake to elevate people uh, especially individuals and especially people of great power, um, and especially in a country where, um, you know, as you just pointed out, Congress is supposed to be the preeminent branch. The representatives of the people are supposed to be the most powerful branch of government. Um, so we ought to regularly drag <laughs> the executives through the mud, I think. You know, um, unfortunately, Congress doesn't really live up to what they used to be, an actual representative body. You know, now they're they're just looking for, okay, how can I 
you know, get recorded on C-SPAN and have that go viral and then fundraise off. You know, and find my next hit on Fox News or MSNBC. sort of show because we have cameras yeah. in Congress. Yep. Um, let's, let's allow stenographers and nothing else. Like, <laughs> I mean, that's, that's about where I stand. Um, you can do like the courtroom, uh, portrait sort yeah. of thing. Like that's fine, but no, no cameras. Some of these members no of Congress devices. only should be depicted in caricatures like that anyway, because they, they kind of are caricatures Some might of, look of better. members of Congress. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm wondering what we would replace President's Day with. I mean, we have we have the case for for Congressperson's Day, but you've just illustrated that that's that's a very fraught case as well. Um, you know, the Supreme Court is something about which voters are more polarized than ever. Um, this has traditionally been, you know, the 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 branch of government that has been most stayed and most respected. Should we have a Citizens Day? We acknowledge veterans in this country. We acknowledge presidents. We acknowledge our nation's independence. But if we are really a nation premised on the idea of self-government, perhaps perhaps we should turn our attention to each other. I'm not against that. But as complicated as we all are. <laughs> <laughs> I still think— talk, Yeah, talk about an interesting collectivization there. Yeah. Uh, I, st- I mean, I still think this is a great opportunity to look in the face the actual facts about some of these people and realize that none of them are as great as anybody wants them to be. And that's OK. That doesn't mean that what they did that was good didn't happen and wasn't good. Um, but maybe maybe we could take this President's Day as an opportunity to bring the presidency down from the pedestal we put it on, which politicizes every issue and makes it all a matter of who you're voting for every four years. Because that is not how it should be, and really still, and for many things, is not how it actually is. Um, I, you know, I won't go on my localism tirade yet again, but you know, vote for your county commissioner and find out who they are and care about that level of things, because it is affecting your life every day in ways that the presidency doesn't. Um, so, and shouldn't. Yeah, so think, think today. Think about your favorite president and dig up whatever dirt you can find on them. All right. Just to pop that bubble, just to destroy the idealism uh, that feeds into this, you know, nationalization and politicization of everything in our country. Let's move on now to uh, just a horrific incident that happened a week ago today on Monday, February 13th at about 8.15 p.m., Uh, Three people were shot and killed, five others wounded in uh, not too far from here, East Lansing, Michigan, home of Michigan State University. What we know at this point, um, the shooter in this incident had been previously charged with carrying a concealed weapon, a felony count that would have prevented him from being able to buy a gun if he were convicted. Uh, But the felony case against him never went to trial. Instead, he pleaded guilty to a misdemeanor, possession of a loaded firearm in or upon a vehicle. And it's uh, in this 2019 plea deal uh, and spent a year and a half on probation, according to the uh, Ingham County Prosecutor's Office. Uh, He had been described as being socially isolated and clashed with his parents and uh, being totally lost and bitter and isolated and, quote, evil angry, which is a horrifying way to describe somebody uh, after his mother died uh, unexpectedly of a stroke. Um, Obviously, another one of these incidents that we're talking about again uh, it's sad and it is awful and it is terrible. And it is a cycle that we see not just with these kinds of incidents, but the reactions that people have to them, um, where people just retreat into previous arguments that they would make even without this incident as a uh, point off of which to base themselves, uh, where proposals by people in favor of some kind of gun control um, – irrespective of their merits in and of themselves, usually are not reflective of any kind of reality of the incident that just happened, as well as a resistance to uh, any kind of talk of legislative, I I hesitate to use the word solutions for anything, but legislative measures to address anything like this. So there's a conversation that usually never proceeds very far, but there are two things that I want to hasten to add. Um, One is the same thing that I have said when we've talked about incidents like this previously, which is 
Uh, we can have a debate about gun control measures and things like that, but legislation policy does not fix broken souls, and it is never going to. Uh, so to expect that people who are as lost as the individual uh, that I just described in for, who, who perpetrated this incident uh, is going to be fixed by policy changes is is naive at best. Um, the uh, other part of this that is a, a trend that I just see I evolving and I just find very disappointing, uh, Ranjiv Puri, who is a state representative here in Michigan. I believe he is the, uh, let me check here, the House Majority Whip uh, from the Democratic Party. Um, the beginning of his statement about the shooting at Michigan State University began with, F your thoughts and prayers, um, which... As disappointing as the dialogue that usually follows horrific incidents like this is, this is just a new evolution of how terrible it can it, it can actually become. Um, as my wife remarked to me over the weekend, for the people who are responding like this, like, well, what what for just me, the average person, right? Who was I'm not a legislature, I have no policy making role. What am I supposed to say? What what is what is the proper reaction? Am I only supposed to virtue signal towards legislative uh, desires that I would have had irrespective of this individual incident? Is that the only thing that's appropriate now? I just find it kind of sad and disappointing. Um, again, I have no real problem with profanity. Like I'll just throw that out there. Like it's not the fact that um, the F word was used in a statement by a member of the House of Representatives. I don't really get my panties in a bunch about that. But the sentiment that's being expressed there, that the idea of prayer, which is deeply meaningful to people of faith and who people of faith will tell you uh, is important and works – uh, being dismissed so curtly like this is is just a disappointing thing to see. So I think people have that reaction, um, whether rightly or not, through a perception that people are hiding behind, uh, oh, I'll, you know, thoughts and, uh, thoughts and prayers instead of actually doing anything about it. So I think there's a real frustration there, and I'm sure there's at least one person out there who is genuinely hypocritical in their statement along those lines. So, you know, I don't want to go too far but i i mean i i'm not opposed to profanity in private but there is a thing called propriety <laughs> and I, I would hope a elected official would care about that um we've we've way we've crossed that bridge a long time ago unfortunately um uh yeah and i'm tempted to take back everything i just said about state and local uh representation <laughs> being being great i burst um, your bubble but, on that one huh but no i mean i agree with you that that you know there's this comes down to the heart. This comes down to a person who obviously is very hurting um, and had very harmful patterns of thought, really needed help. One way or another did not get that help. Doesn't mean that no one tried. Maybe people did. Um, I look at the the fall, the, the previous, uh, you know, run in with the law and a, a gun and um, Maybe the solution is we got to be we got to be tougher. We got to have, uh, you know, three strikes law or, you know, whatever this kind of. But every time we do that, there's a ton of innocent people or people who just, you know, have reasons <laughs> um, for what we think is terrible, who are not potential mass shooters who end up getting locked away. You know, we did the same thing with drugs. Right. We have a bunch of people uh, who just had marijuana and now they're in jail and. They're not contributing to society. They're not being, they're not flourishing. Doesn't mean that marijuana is a good thing. I don't think it is. I don't think walking around with a loaded gun, uh, unregistered or whatever, you know, the case may be, is a good thing either. Um, but there's just no policy solution which will not have unintended consequences. Maybe those are consequences we think we are willing to pay as a society. And maybe that's a discussion we should have. But um, I, you know, I, I look at the other side of this. Why does anyone say, you know, thoughts and prayers? Um, hopefully because they genuinely mean it. I don't, I never understood the thoughts part of that. Who cares what I'm thinking? I, you know, if I pray, well, then I'm talking to someone who can actually do something <laughs> about it. God, um, I, I unfortunately can't, I don't have any ability to do that. Um, but I think the other reason why people do that is because they don't know what to say. Um, so there was an interesting story. I believe it was Vanderbilt. Um, it came out 
that they sent a kind of condolence statement. Uh, as everybody, every university, of course, feels obligated. We got to say something. Um, this could have been our school. Uh, and so they sent this kind of, you know, expected language sort of statement. Uh, but they forgot at the end to delete the automated uh, text that said it was generated by chat GTP. Um, and people are upset about this. Understandably so. But I want to kind of offer a contrarian sort of defense that when something happens, positive or negative, a lot of times people go to the store and they buy these little cards that have words already written inside of them in order to express something that they want to say, but they don't know how to say it. Um, I usually get frustrated and I just look for a blank card so I can write my own thing because I, I never like the stuff that's out there, but I get it. I, there's a reason why those cards exist. There's a reason why that people make money making those cards. I think this is the same sort of thing. These, you know, to be fair, maybe maybe they're just awful administrators and they're completely cynical and they could care less. They're like, well, we have to do this. So we'll just let a robot write it. Um, maybe. Um, but I, I think part of it is, okay, we want to say this, but we don't know how to, you know, what, what do you say? It's just tragic. It's, you know, in the Christian tradition, at least, um, you could also root it in maybe Platonism. Uh, there's an idea that evil has no existence of itself, right? It is it is a corruption of what is good, um, which also means that it's fundamentally irrational. That no matter what you say, it's not going to explain it. It's not going to say, "Oh, now it all makes sense now." You know, now now that's okay. It's never going to be okay. It is that is the the nature of tragedy here, um, and so we, I think that's that's what we see. I hope that we find. Some ways, and I'm sure Michigan State will implement new policies. I'm sure, you know, I'm, it's not it's not that nobody's going to do nothing as a result of this, um, but I have no idea. You know, is there a silver bullet? Is there something that can be done? I don't know. I think we live in a world that is tragic, um, and I hope people will do what they can. But I also, I also think it's it's unfortunate that people get into this rut where they're so cynical that they can't even can't even take anybody's word for it when they say, you know, that my thoughts and prayers with those who have been hurt in this situation. Um, and on the other hand, uh, I, 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 my contrarian take is I actually think, you know, going to chat GTP, it's like, it'd be like turning over a card and saying, what Hallmark, you didn't <laughs> write this, you know, like, yeah, like people do that all the time. Yeah. Um, so it, to me, I look at it as maybe this is one of the, the more positive uses of this new technology that everybody's kind of freaking out about is it's, it lets you say stuff that you don't know how to say. Um, I, I, that's kind of good. They wanted to say something more substantial than thoughts and prayers, but they didn't know how to do it. So they went to a robot. The robot wrote it for them. And unfortunately, they forgot, they forgot to delete the robot's signature at the bottom. But maybe we could just be okay with that. Yeah, they for, were transparent about what they did. That was nice. Um, for everybody who ever has been in that position where it's just they don't have the words, it's possible to have someone or something help you find the words. Yeah. So this is, this is my contrarian contrarian take. Okay. Is that what we need to begin with any processing of any tragedy, and in fact, any challenge or, 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 or joy in life, is to begin with thought and prayer. Because why do we, you know, there are certain people who are gifted with words. There are certain others that aren't. Um, you know, Moses famously told God that he was not one of those people, and please send someone else. Um, but God said that he would give the words, and what people need to do is think through, this is what an administrator at a university is responsible for doing, is thinking through how does this national tragedy affect this particular community? And what does this particular community need to hear at this moment? This is why we have those people here is to speak to this community and to be rallying points for this community. And if they can't do that, they shouldn't be in the position they're in. If they do not realize how this is affecting the community, if they're not properly embedded in the community, if they're not able to serve the community through communication, this is what administrators do. They issue memos. Um, this is their job. Um, that's a problem. Thinking through these things is how we make progress. 
thinking through as prosecutors, how should I hope every prosecutor in this country is thinking through this and praying about this? Because there are challenges involved in prosecutorial discretion, and there can be very real consequences in the world, as we've tragically witnessed, to the use and abuse of that prosecutorial discretion. And that is very difficult to do. And that is why certain people are entrusted with this. And this is why that we as a community should be praying for these people, that they have the wisdom and the judgment. We should be thinking through these people as their elected officials in many cases, thinking who can best do this very difficult thing that we ask. We should be praying for families that have angry people that they know that are that they care about, that they worry about, we should be, they should be thinking through how they can be of service to those people. They should be praying about it. They should be going to God. This is, as legislators assemble and think about, is there an appropriate response? They should be thinking that through. This tragedy should be an occasion for thinking, and it should be an occasion for praying. And if you don't begin there, what are you left with? You're left with naked action and power. And that is not the way that you come to any sort of constructive solution. And to discourage people to think through these issues, to discourage people to pray about these issues— is not going to bring us closer to any sort of solution, legislative, personal, private. This is what this occasion can do. When you open yourself up to thinking about it, thinking about it in your own individual context, who are those people in my life that I know are struggling? What are the positive things that I can do to make my neighbors safer? If you're not thinking through that, you're going to be at a loss when tragedy strikes. And it's particularly in these moments of tragedy that we should be thinking through these things, that we should be praying about them, that we should be considering them. Because even if there is an appropriate legislative action, our response cannot be limited to that because people will slip through the cracks because we have prosecutors, because we have juries, because we have all of these things that are required for legislation to have any real effect on anyone in their lives. And those people need to be engaged, thoughtful citizens, and prayerful people, mindful of others. All good points. Uh, and, I, and I absolutely don't disagree. Um, I will say, though, uh, not to compare any college administrators to Moses. Uh, but in their defense, even though the anger of the Lord burned against Moses, the next thing he said well, was, well, what about your brother Aaron? Maybe he can speak for you. Um, so maybe chat GTP shouldn't do the speaking, although, again, I think we can be sympathetic uh, and understand maybe where that was coming from. But maybe they should hire someone who can p put that thought into words. Some administrators are there because they're good at dealing with procedures and fundraising and they're not really good at, even if they do genuinely care and empathize they're not really good at being articulate in that way so i i i want to be empathetic even with even with them um but certainly in everything everybody does you know really great point um i hope everyone begins with thought and prayer i hope they continue thinking and praying uh, throughout all of this and wherever you are, whatever your vocation is, whatever your community is, and whoever is a member of that community that you are thinking and praying about them. I want to pull out one thing in reference to what I had read earlier that people should be thinking and praying about because there there is a different angle in this one, which is that story that I gave you about this person being charged with uh, carrying a concealed weapon, uh, charged with a felony pled down to a misdemeanor, which would not have prevented him from continuing to possess a firearm. Uh, I think something to spend some time thinking and praying about is that orientation of our legal system right now that doesn't often take the charges that are initially charged 
to trial by a jury of the peers of the individual facing those charges to have that adjudicated. That instead it becomes this system that becomes almost a game where you just – you load up on as many charges as you can to incentivize that person to plea down to something lower so that you get a conviction, you move the case off the books, but you as the attorney prosecuting it don't have to spend a whole lot of time in the courtroom. You know what? Maybe they should spend a little bit more time in the courtroom with some of these cases and they should actually take the charges that are equal to the incident to a jury and actually prosecute them and actually make a case and try to convince a jury that they should convict this person on that. Um, We've talked about this with regard to the violence in Chicago before, that one of the things that the Cook County State's Attorney's Office just basically by policy declines to prosecute are straw purchases, uh, straw gun purchases from Northwest Indiana that are then brought into Chicago. uh, Because there's it's just not very sexy. They're not going to get big headlines based off convicting some 60-year-old woman who purchased a gun, gave it to somebody else uh, without clear disclosure that they were buying it for someone else. Um, these things are problems. And I think we see this in the nature of our legal system, not just when it comes to criminal cases like this, but all kinds of cases where the whole operation is geared towards overcharging and getting the person to plea down to something less than that. That's just not the way, like just as we were discussing with Congress, this is not the way the Congress is supposed to function. This is not the way our legal system is supposed to function. You're supposed to be judged by a jury of your peers on the charges that are brought with you that um, the charges that address the alleged crime that you committed. And I think we can see here an example of how that culture can create awful unintended consequences. If this person had been convicted of a felony, they have a much diff- more difficult time. Not that it would have prevented this incident from happening, but it would have made, a, for especially people who are interested in that part of the question, the acquisition of the implement, the tool that was used in the commission of this crime, would have made it a lot more difficult for that person to acquire it. It's worth, again, stressing that doesn't mean this wouldn't have happened. And I I think that is one of the things, maybe the reason that so many people want to eschew thoughts and prayers is because it's hard to think about that, that you could try to do everything thinkable and conceivable and possible, and you still not may be able to prevent something like this from happening. That's a horrible thing to have to contemplate, but it is something worth our contemplation if we're going to get beyond just vapid sloganeering that is the same thing, again, uh, that people would have said on both sides of this, whether or not this incident in Michigan State ever happened. So maybe to follow on that, um, you know, one thing we need to be thinking and praying about um, is not just what are we going to do now or, you know, all the things we already mentioned, but also what is the incentive structure? that leads to this um, and, and in every sort of case. you know, Why are people going out of state to purchase guns? Why are people not being prosecuted? Why are cases not going to court? There are reasons, uh, most likely because it is easy or easier for whoever is involved to do it that way. So we have to ask why. Uh, maybe you know the reforms that would make a difference, again, I, I agree, you're never going to you're never going to get a silver bullet. Very bad metaphor now that I think about it. You're never going to get, you know... There's no perfect solution. Perfect solution yeah. out of this. Um, but that doesn't mean you can't improve. Um, I don't think we should despair of getting better. But one way to get better is to have that more economic mindset and ask what what is the incentive structure that's actually motivating people to do things? Not what are just the laws, but why why are people behaving in the way in which they're behaving? Um, it is one of the the great gifts of the science of economics to improve the practice of prudence uh, in our societies, and I, that's something that I really hope is part of people's thinking and praying as well. We were going to talk about the train derailment in East Palestine, Ohio, but I'm going to pass on that subject uh, in the interest of time because I want to come around to what was to be our final topic, uh, which is this interesting story out of the United Kingdom. Uh, I'll read from the beginning of an article here from the Associated Press. Uh, Critics are accusing the British publisher of Roald Dahl's classic children's books of censorship after it removed colorful language from works such as Charlie and the Chocolate Factory and Matilda to make them more acceptable to modern readers. 
A review of new editions of Dahl's books, now available in bookstores, show that some passages relating to weight, mental health, gender, and race were altered. The changes made by Puffin Books, a division of Penguin Random House, were first reported by Britain's Daily Telegraph newspaper. I'll give you some examples here. Augustus Gloop, Charlie's gluttonous antagonist in Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, which originally was published in 1964, is no longer enormously fat, just enormous. In the new edition of Witches, a supernatural female posing as an ordinary woman may be working as uh, a, quote, top scientist or running a business instead of as a cashier in a supermarket or typing letters for a businessman. The word black was removed from the description of the terrible tractors uh, in 1970s, The Fabulous Mr. Fox. Uh, The machines are now simply murderous, brutal-looking monsters. So this actually made me think of, uh, for those who have seen, uh, either read the book or have especially seen the movie version of Christopher Buckley's Thank You for Smoking, um, uh, Senator Ortolan Finister, who is the senator from uh, Vermont, is on this mission in the book uh, to get a label identifying cigarettes as poison affixed to packages of cigarettes. And at the end of the movie, he's moved on to uh, other things in the same pursuit where you have famous pictures of Hollywood celebrities who were holding cigarettes because that was a thing at the time. And they've all been edited out. So it's like, you know, holding a little party thing that you, you know, blow through and Right. Um, uh, Or, you know, instead of, uh, you know, uh, the smoke coming off of the cigarette, it is a cup of coffee and it's the steam coming off of it now. And he said, it's like, you know, don't you think you're changing history? He's like, no, I I think we're improving history, Uh, which is just I I love the line and I I love that uh, portrayal in Thank You for Smoking. But I mean, this is a this was inevitable, right? Like the trend that we have seen of. Words are violence, and certain things cannot be uttered. They cannot be heard. Um, I mean, you can trace this back to, uh, you know, you can trace back farther than anything I'm going to point out, I'm sure, but the adventures of Huckleberry Finn and words that are used in in that. There are plenty of things that also, which is it, it, interesting that it ends up on this list all the time now because I feel like both the left and the right have their obsession about banned books, uh, which usually are never banned. Um, they are only limited in terms of an individual library, usually a school library, and whether or not they're going to have them. It's not quite the marketing angle that used to exist where, you know, if you remember Band in Boston was a big deal and it was a good way to sell books anywhere other than Boston was to affix the label to it, Band in Boston, because anybody who remembers being a kid, the minute you're told you can't do this, you can't read this, you can't see this, you can't listen to this, you can't watch this, what's the first thing that you want to do? You want to see it, you want to listen to it, you want to read it, you want to watch it. So it's good marketing in that sense. But I I guess this kind of thing was just uh, inevitable that when you see book publishers at first resistant to the idea of even publishing new books at all because they think the people who have written them or, or who are they are about are problematic, it was only inevitable that we go back in time and immediately and start updating uh, language like this to reflect modern norms, or at least the desired modern norms of a certain set of people. So this this sort of thing is not new, as you pointed out. And if I remember right, I think the the absolute the case that that takes the cake uh, is Ray Bradbury discovered that there was an edited version of Fahrenheit, an unauthorized edited version of Fahrenheit four fifty one being used. This is the the book about the dystopia in which books are burned. <laughs> Just a little um, too on the nose. So I, I maybe I'll look, I'll try to find because he he wrote, you know, it's, I think it's like the the current introduction to the book. He talks about this, you know, attempt to revise it and make it, you know, sanitize it. Um, in the case of Roald Dahl, you know, if if any of these expressions are offensive, um, genuinely so, that's too bad. Um, but Turns out people, you know, just like presidents, uh, also authors of books have bad ideas. Uh, I remember a few years ago, um, there was some information coming out about uh, Dr. Seuss and his political cartoons, um, which are awful and racist, Um, like just genuinely so. They're indefensible, I think, Um, to the point where I personally uh, was like, you know, there's a lot of great children's books and children's offers out there. I only had one child at the time. I have four now. But I was like, I don't need to, 
to do any more Dr. Seuss. I'll just find other stuff. So I did that. So I guess I personally canceled Dr. Seuss in my home. Um, but I wasn't calling for other people to do so. That was just my own free choice. And I kind of feel like, why not just let people make that choice instead of saying, we need to do this for them. We need to hide the reality, the facts of history from people because we are afraid they can't come to the same enlightened conclusion that we have. Um, there is a real danger in that. Uh, this is the exact danger that Bra- Ray Bradbury was worried about. Um, and it is something that even when it is something that is truly distasteful, we should object to this sort of thing. Um, yeah, uh, you know, let a book be what it is and then decide whether or not you want to read it or share it with your children and family. One of the things that's interesting about this story is that unlike in the Bradbury case, this is the estate of Raul Dahl that's doing this. This is the holder of the intellectual property. <laughs> and I think that should cause us to rethink how we've thought about intellectual property. We think about intellectual pro- property in terms of, especially with creative works, as serving a dual purpose, to maintain the integrity of the work against sort of fakes, forgeries, unauthorized alterations, as in the Bradbury case, and to provide some window where the the artists can, can reap a sort of a reward for their creative effort through an exclusive license. And we see in this case that um, you know what's being sought here is is the remun- the remunerative award. The Dahl estate was not horrified enough by these texts to relinquish the copyright and say we don't want anything to do with these offensive texts anymore. It was no, we need to modify them so we can continue making money. Um, so I think artists should think about this now. Artists who you know, in a time of ever lengthening copyright links, artists today need to be mindful of this, that uh, estates, trusts, foundations will not necessarily preserve your vision. And in fact, there might be certain market forces. I have no doubt that one of the reasons this revision came was because there were overzealous concerned school librarians who wrote letters of, I love this book, except why did he have to call this woman fat? Um, And there is, there are parents, and this is is part of the trick, because Dahl is someone whose charm exists as the product of his transgressiveness. The fact that these sort of impolite statements are made is part of the charm and part of what gets a rise out of children of, oh, I wish I could call that old lady fat, but my parents would hit me if I did. So instead, I will retreat to this realm of fiction in which children can say derogatory things about adults with impunity. Um, so you have you have a number of, of forces here. I think – You've also got a concern with, you know, what does this look like a hundred years from now when the copyright of doll books is no longer in the hands of the trust or foundation or estate? Will publishers looking to republish the classics publish the original editions or the balderdized editions? And... From what we know, from human experience, where these sorts of balderdized editions of the things in the past have risen, you know, they, they rise and fall. And people want to return to the originals. There is a hunger for that original authorial vision, even, even as, you know, literary criticism goes away from that. Uh, people, people hunger for those original texts. So I have, I have no doubt that when, uh, when the, uh, when the copyright is, is, is ripped from the uh, hands of the trusts, that these books will find second life in their original unadulterated form. Dan brought up the point that I was going to make is, uh, again, we're trying to go and trace back in time how long these kinds of things have been happening. And, yeah, you can go to uh, Thomas Boulder and his The Family Shakespeare, which uh, removed, quote, those words and expressions which cannot with propriety be read aloud in a family. Again, in 
Shakespeare. Uh, it is something, again, that has been happening for a very long time. And one of the things that always fascinates me about this are the implications of about the human person being made by those individuals who are making the decision to do these kinds of edits. What is it exactly that they think is going to happen if the books with the original language are read by people out there? Um, there's always seemingly this assumption that if you read a racial epithet in The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn, that you may be a perfectly normal loving, wonderful individual, but the minute you read that racial epithet, you now dislike an entire race of people. There, there seems to be this kind of implication that everybody is just ready to be set off by hearing the wrong word, that they are going to have a set of beliefs coming into reading a book, and they're going to have a completely different set of beliefs coming out of it. Certainly, people can be affected by the things that they read. Uh, but there's, there always seems to me to be this implication that everybody is just one word or one little incident away from going from being a perfectly normal person to a raging racist or homophobe or bigot or misogynist of some kind based on the material that they are reading, rather than thinking that most people uh, – at age-appropriate levels, there are certainly things that you wouldn't give a 10-year-old to read. Um, and again, that falls into the realm of parents. Um, I, I will note that there's a similar phenomenon going on right now that I, I find that's semi-related to this, not exactly related, but uh, Senator Josh Hawley from Missouri has introduced legislation that will require uh, anybody who to uh, be 16 years old to open a social media account. Uh, which, again, is something I find fascinating against the backdrop of the same kind of individuals like Josh Hawley complaining that companies like Meta collect too much information on all of this. So his solution is he's going to introduce legislation that mandates we all scan our government-issued driver's licenses or IDs and send them to Meta. That is his solution to this problem. Again, rather than leaving it where it should be, which is the realm of parents. This desire to act as a parental authority figure that we see in senators and, and congresspeople like Josh Hawley and some of uh, you know their, their worst legislative forms, but also in individuals and even including the, the people who own the copyrights to these works to say people just can't hear these things. Bad things are going to happen if people hear or read these things. So we have to change it. We, uh, we're not changing history. We're improving history. They're all Ordal and Finister at the end of the day trying to make it a better world, world through not having people hear icky, n nasty, naughty words. I mean there is – I absolutely agree. There is a sphere of sovereignty that belongs to the family – as a matter of natural law that absolutely has to be upheld. And that includes in these cases. I mean, ironically, I'm sure Josh Hawley, given his political orientation, would claim to be a defender of the family. And yet here he is trying to run roughshod over the authority of parents. I think that's at least a contradiction. Um, to get to Huck Finn, um, I, you know, I'm an editor, so I don't want to get into the weeds here, but... Words don't exist in isolation. They People string them together into these things called sentences, and they put those together into paragraphs, and they put paragraphs together to convey an idea or story. And spoiler alert, the moral of Huck Finn is that racism is bad. So hopefully people reading – now, the good news is when people think, they also think in terms of uh, sentences and paragraphs and not just isolated words. So – Hopefully, the people reading these books will also use that same ability to form better thoughts rather than magically change uh, their entire orientation based on a word they read. Uh, so, I mean, there I don't understand the anthropology behind this kind of worry. Um, it's a really strange sort of crusade to try to ban an anti-racist book in the name of anti-racism. Um, I... I have no sympathy for that and very little understanding of it, frankly. There's also an interesting phenomenon that if, you know, we could call 
these 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 new these you know when you say new modern values, I sound like I'm I, I'm sound like I'm channeling Virginia Woolf and like the early 20th century. We've had new modern values for a long long time. They're no longer new nor modern. But the reality of it is, is how human culture develops is things fall in and out of circulation. And if you are really dedicated to these new modern values and see them as triumphant, um, you should be comfortable with letting works that don't resonate with those values merely fade into obscurity. And in fact, be replaced by books that articulate better values. Um, This is something that happens. The vast majority of texts we have, the vast majority of the world's literature throughout its history has been forgotten. What has preserved has gone through because people have, through the ages, taken it up and read it again and again and again. And civilization itself is this sorting mechanism, and you don't have to do this sort of violence. And this is this is the other thing is I'm wondering what young adult writers today, there are many, young adult fiction is very much animated by a lot of these concerns today that animate, you know, the, the sort of balderdization of Roald Dahl. What do these authors think? You know, this is their niche, is the articulators of these new values in childhood fiction. And they are getting the rug pulled out from under them by the doll estate. <laughs> you know, parents who had these concerns, parents who wanted these new sets of values, there are authors today writing according to those principles who have, from the beginning, employed sensitivity readers to go over. This is where this whole, I mean, this is a, a literally a an industry unto itself in young adult fiction now. Um, And there's a way, you know, these authors, you know, parents could, if parents wanted this sort of thing, they could seek out these new authors. These new authors are dedicated to these values. They are animating principles of their fiction. Uh, They believe children should learn them. And uh, there's plenty out there for parents to choose from if that's what they would like. Um, And I can't help but think if this becomes a trend, like you have today, you know, when music streaming, you know, the vast majority of music that's streamed is old music now. Is the old and the familiar. And if we keep reshaping the past according to current standards, that undermines the artistic developments of people working today in a very interesting way. And I'd, I'd be very interested to hear the perspectives of, of some of these authors that, that you know, these, these sorts of concerns are their concerns, you know, um, does this undermine their own work and their own contributions to, uh, to uh, civilization? I know I've mentioned this book on this uh, podcast before, there's this interesting book by Chuck Klosterman called But What If We're Wrong that tries to get us to look at the present the way that we look at the past. And one of the questions that he raises in there is about literature and what of the, you know, what of modern literature is going to be remembered in the same way that we remember things like Moby Dick. And part of his answer is if it is something that has had a lot of uh, people fussing over it when it is current, it probably isn't going to have a whole lot of staying power Uh, because everything that you could possibly think or interpret out of that book is going to have been thought or interpreted by somebody writing reviews of it. It is uh, going to have the author commenting about it contemporaneous to the publishing of that book as opposed to – Stories like Herman Melville's Moby Dick, which was not a hit when it was initially published. And it is only adopted later and becomes this loved piece of fiction over time. And one of the reasons that Klosterman points out there is because 
because there's a deficit of exploration of the work when it is brand new, it allows people to come along much later, pick it up, and bring their own interpretations to the text. That not everything that could be said about it has been definitively said, said by the author. That there is one way to understand this book. And it's like, so are we going to regard infinite jest as being this, you know, great piece of literature 150 years from now? The answer, probably not, because it has been poured over. It's going to be something that nobody is really thinking or talking about uh, right now. That is written and released right now, but it is not getting a lot of attention right now that will allow people to pick it up later down the road and add their own interpretation to it. Um, I, I just think that that is an interesting part of the perspective about what it, what will it be that is important and cherished. So all of this effort being poured into drawing attention to either currently problematic or older works that have these problematic elements to it, I just think it misses the point about why literature ends up being cherished over time. It's because people can pick it up and they can bring their experiences, their point of view to this work and get something out of it without being instructed. This is what you're supposed to get out of this book, which just kind of goes against the whole concept of why we create things like works of literature in the first place. It makes me think of uh, Bob Dylan, uh, surely someone whose music will outlive him, although he's still alive, amazingly, and still touring um, and still making music. Uh, but he would get asked by reporters all the time, what do you mean when you said this or you wrote that? And he hated the question. He would usually refuse to answer it or he'd just say something cryptic and he'd totally troll the, <laughs> the reporter or whatever. But people return to those songs, even though some of them are very specific. You know, he mentions, you know, news headlines, you know, and he writes whole songs about things that are happening in his day, but he does so in a way that speaks to something universal and something that is transferable uh, to people in their own times. You know, if you think of the uh, the song Hurricane, um, which, which could be canceled by some people's standards, um, it's about, you know, this uh, uh, specific box. Why am I forgetting the name? Somebody had with the name of... Uh, Hurricane Carter. It's about Hurricane Carter um, and how he was wrongfully convicted of murder and he was stuck in jail. And so Bob Dylan wrote a song about it. And it's an amazing song. And it's an amazing song, not just for that one person, although there's that, there's that but it's about uh, a miscarriage of justice uh, due to racial prejudice. And it's the sort of thing that is unfortunately uh, continues to be timely, um, despite the fact that there is there is a word in there that I would never personally repeat. Um, that's part of the song. I hope nobody censors it someday because it's a powerful song. And even the way in which that word is used, although I would not myself use it, um, it adds to the power of, the again, the very positive and universal message to the song. So, um, yeah, I think there's something to that, that there's it's the books that you can't uh, that you can't figure out. Um, entirely that people keep coming back to, you know, something like The Great Gatsby, um, where you read this whole book and you think it's about this guy and his, you know, hopeless love for this this woman who got away. But at the end, it turns out it's about America. And now you have to think, M maybe I should read this whole book again, right? Um, and I still haven't figured it out, and it's still maybe my favorite book. But uh, um, so there's 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 just yeah, there's there's something I think very much to that. Um, that people, you know, people made a big deal about the Hunger Games. Those are fun books. I don't know if they're going to be up there with Moby Dick someday, right? Um, so we'll see. Maybe I'll be wrong about that. But Let's call it a wrap there. Thank you for listening to Act and Unwind. If you're listening to this podcast on our website, please look right now in the show notes where you're going to find a link where you can subscribe directly to Act and Unwind or just search Act and Unwind on your favorite podcast app. Also, please rate and review us on Apple Podcasts five-star reviews only so that more people can find this program. Thanks to Dan. Thanks to Dylan for the Acton Institute. I'm Eric Cohn. We'll see you next week. Horatio. <laughs> <laughs> Magellan Crunch. <laughs> is that now? Did it actually like? Is there some uh, I have uh, no idea. Captain Crunch canon they're drawing from, or did it just completely make that up? Deep, deep canon.